Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. This is the first uh, Scottish Learning Festival that I've attended as Education Secretary, and a great joy to be here. Um, people ask me if I miss being the Finance Minister of Scotland. And I have to say to you, in all honesty, on no occasion when I was the Finance Minister of Scotland did I ever go to an event that had such a joyous start as the start that was given to us by the City of Edinburgh Music School. So um, for that alone, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be with you today. And when the First Minister asked me to, uh, to, to change my jobs, I was in my comfort zone, nine years as Finance Minister. Uh, I knew the responsibilities and the requirements inside out. Nothing, nothing would have stopped me accepting the offer to become the Education Secretary in Scotland because what could be a greater privilege than having the opportunity to work with pupils, parents, teachers, the wider stakeholder community in Scotland to create a world-class education system here in Scotland. So that privilege for me is one that I readily accepted and which it captures for me the excitement and the exhilaration of what it is to be involved in Scottish education today. And I think it's really important that we understand at the outset of the discussions that we have today, some of the perspectives that I have about Scottish education and what's in my mind about the, the strengths of Scottish education and the challenges that we face as a country. Scottish education has been constructed and developed over hundreds of years based on some strong and enduring values of the importance and the centrality of education to the nurture of individuals, to the enablement of those individuals to fulfill their potential and to ensure that lives were transformed, that young people were able to see their opportunities transformed from a background or for some of growing up in poverty to find real accomplishment and fulfillment by the power and the effectiveness of education. And young people with challenges have had their lives transformed by the power and the significance of education. So ensuring that the, the values of our education system are deeply enshrined in our society is a central part of what our education system has to do. So the wise people who considered and thought about the contents of Curriculum for Excellence and all that it had to represent for the future of our country did us a great service by enshrining four clear substantive values right at the heart of Curriculum for Excellence. Values of wisdom, compassion, justice, and integrity. Four words, four magnificent words. Wisdom, compassion, justice, and integrity. Not random words chosen from nowhere to drive our curriculum, but the four words that are inscribed on the mace of our national parliament linking every single school in every single part of our country following curriculum for excellence with the values of wisdom, compassion, justice and integrity right to the heart of our national democracy as a country. And why is that important? Well, it's important for me because those four words capture for me what Scotland and Scottish education is all about. It is about wisdom, compassion, justice and integrity, about who we are, what we're about as a country, and what we need our education system to reflect for the people of Scotland and particularly for the young people of Scotland. So we have at the heart of our education system a really strong values-based curriculum which is the foundation of educational opportunity for Scotland. And it's important that we take stock at this point about the, the, the condition of Scottish education and where we find Scottish education today. The OECD undertook a major assessment of Curriculum for Excellence and Scottish Education, which broadly said that we had undertaken a bold reform with Curriculum for Excellence and we should stick with it and we should celebrate the fact that it is a curriculum of strong, powerful, enduring characteristics. It's something to be proud of in terms of the educational reform that we've undertaken. And I'd be the first to accept that the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence has put enormous strain on the education system to get to where we are today of having a strong and well-founded curriculum within Scotland. And the OECD said to us that we should be right to be proud 
of the achievements and proud of our boldness in undertaking that, um, uh, that reform, but we needed to make sure that we continued to be bold in the years to come. So the combined input of our educational, the International Council of Educational Advisors that uh, we heard from in the, the film piece just a moment ago and the OECD largely said to us that while we had a strong curriculum, we'd taken bold reforms, that we um, had undertaken significant changes, we needed to continue an agenda of reform to make sure that we fulfilled the potential of Scottish education. They urged us to strengthen the middle of Scottish education by ensuring that we encourage and motivate and enable uh, the development of strong leadership within every level of education within Scotland, that we empowered teachers, that we got bureaucracy off the back of teachers and freed teachers up much more to undertake the important job of learning that they, un they, they have to undertake. And they encouraged us to ensure that we took decisions and enabled decisions about education to be taken very much informed by the experience and the life chances of young people in Scottish education. So all of these assessments are an important foundation of the agenda that we have to take forward. But I think what captured it for me is the quote that was played in the film there from Dr. Avis Glaze, one of the world's renowned educationalists. And Avis Glaze said to us that Scottish education had always been a strong system, but the heartwarming thing about it today is that we're not resting on our laurels that we're not resting on our laurels. And I think that sums up what I find is the appetite within Scottish education to make sure that, yes, we do celebrate the foundations of Scottish education, but we are determined to build on those foundations and ensure that we excel to a greater extent on behalf of the young people of Scotland. So, as we formulate the agenda to take forward Scottish education, it's absolutely essential that we have a crystal clear policy framework in which we're operating to undertake that journey of improvement. And for me, our education policy is enshrined by, by three major policies that the government takes forward. The first is getting it right for every child, which is what it says on the tin. We have a duty, all of us, you, me, all of us, to get it right for every child in Scotland, which means adapting our approaches and our interventions to make sure we best meet the needs of every single young person, regardless of their background and their circumstances and their talents and their challenges. So getting it right for every child is one of the three foundations of our policy approach. The second is curriculum for excellence, a bold reform embedded in the values of our country, a, a, a curriculum that is designed to empower the teaching profession, to maximize the, the creativity of the profession, uh, to deliver for young people within Scotland. And the third is developing Scotland's young workforce, of recognising that we have a duty to ensure that we work with every young person in Scotland to find the best outcome we possibly can do and equip them to fulfil their potential uh, as part of the, uh, the economic assets of our country. Because without that, without that linkage between our education system and the world of work and the future occupations of our young people, we will not be able to ensure that we maximise the economic impact and the social contribution that can be made by young people in future generations. So in three very simple statements, getting it right for every child, curriculum for excellence and developing Scotland's young workforce, we have to weave all of that together to make sure that we undertake and deliver a successful education system in Scotland. But it's a complicated world that we occupy and at the heart of how we need to address that, uh, we need to have clarity in all that we do. And I received a gift after the election in May, which I wanted to share with you, which has helped me enormously in thinking about what I've got to do to bring to this job. And it's not one of those lavish gifts that you normally suspect that politicians are on the receiving end of. It's a small ceramic tile, and you won't be able to see it very clearly or to read it, but I'll explain it to you. It comes from a, 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 an architectural intervention that was inspired by the writings of Tom Johnson, the post-war Secretary of State for Scotland, a Labour Secretary of State for Scotland, who 
believed that in the aftermath of the turmoil of war, we had an obligation to create better days. And he illustrated it by the need to create better architecture. And the architectural uh, collective sent every member of parliament one of these little ceramic tiles to mark the optimism of a new parliament and the pursuit of better days for our country. And each tile has a word typed on it in good old-fashioned typewriter letters, the things that I grew up on. And the word that came in my one is purpose. Purpose. So in all this great, complicated, complex world that we operate, I thought it was ser serendipity that when I opened up my envelope with my ceramic tile in it, it said purpose. And that said to me, I have to give to the education system in Scotland the absolute clarity of purpose as, a, as to what we are about. And I'm crystal clear in my mind what I'm about and what I've got to do in the course of this parliamentary term. The First Minister has appointed me to work with you and with all of our stakeholders throughout Scotland to close the attainment gap in Scottish education. That is my purpose. And that is what you will hear from me relentlessly. It won't change in the next five years because I know what the First Minister will do to me on the eve of the 2021 election. She will turn round to me and say, so, how are you getting on with closing the attainment gap? I'm crystal clear that is what she expects of me and that is what will drive every single thing that I do to achieve success in Scottish education, to close the attainment gap by focusing, as Bill Maxwell said, at the outset of this uh, festival, on the twin aspirations of excellence and equity in Scottish education. We don't close the attainment gap in Scottish education by levelling down. We close the attainment gap in Scotland by levelling up and raising aspiration and performance in everything that we do in Scottish education. But to enable that to happen, we've got to have a very clear agenda. And this is where I accept that the agenda has been cluttered. So let me set out to you three areas where uh, I've taken immediate action and I'm taking action to address that clutter within Scottish education. A fortnight ago, the Chief Inspector of Education, Bill Maxwell, wrote to every single teacher in the country, and I wrote as well to every single teacher in the country, to set out the definitive guidance on curriculum for excellence. Uh, if you haven't seen the document, it's downloadable from the Education Scotland website. It's been sent by email to every teacher in the country. It comprises five pages of text. It is the definitive guidance on Scottish education. You'll be pleased to hear there will literally be thousands of pages of guidance that will be disappearing from the internet, which is simply getting in the way of confusing the message of what we expect from Scottish education. So if you have any uncertainty in your mind about what you should do or shouldn't do in the education system in Scotland, my advice is to go to that definitive guidance because it was the first step that I took to reduce the, the workload and the burden on teachers, which I freely accept is there and is significant, to enable the teaching profession to do what I set out in my covering letter to every teacher in the country, and that was to liberate teachers to teach. That's how we'll close the attainment gap, by liberating teachers to teach. So the, the guidance that was set out by the Chief Inspector is clear, it is simple, it is short, and crucially, it is definitive. And I urge you to use that in your teaching practice to structure how you go about reducing uh, the unnecessary uh, workload and bureaucracy that has grown up with the developments of the last few years. And in my covering letter to teachers, I said I recounted one comment made to me by a teacher in Scotland who said to me, the judgment has to be made by every teacher. Is what I am doing relevant to the learner's journey? If it is, do it. If it's not, don't. And that's the empowering message of the guidance from the Chief Inspector of Education. So that's the first thing that I've done, to give definitive guidance on curriculum for excellence. The second thing 
is to tackle the issue of workload generated by local authority um, uh, administrative systems and requirements. And I asked the inspectors to go in to look at every local authority and they reported on Monday and essentially said that in about half of the local authorities in Scotland, there were still too many administrative and bureaucratic burdens being required by local authorities which need to be taken out of the system. And I intend to, in half the local authorities, good progress has been made, but in half there is still work to do. So I encourage and I will maintain this pressure on local authorities in Scotland to reduce that administrative burden that's on teachers. For what purpose? So that I can liberate teachers to teach. And that is a crucial part of enabling teachers to focus on the key and essential requirements of the education system. Then the third element of it is the, uh, is the level of assessment that is carried by young people in the senior phase within Scotland. And I've looked very carefully at this issue. I reconvened the Assessment and Qualifications Working Group uh, to take urgent steps to try to tackle this issue. And if I hadn't reconvened the Assessment and Qualifications Group whenever I became the Education Secretary, I would have had the need to do it based on a conversation I had with a group of parents of senior pupils in Shawlands Academy in this city on the day the exam results came out. And those parents were at the school and their young people, you saw some pictures of it in the film there, they were delighted with the performance of their young people. They had achieved magnificent results. And I take my hat off to the young people having the courage and the willingness to open their envelopes in front of live television cameras, which is more than I would ever have done. But at the end of the conversation, the parents took me aside and said to me, look, you've got to do something about the assessment burden on our young people because it is undermining the well-being of our young people. And if I hadn't done anything up, up until that moment, that conversation would have prompted me to do something about it. So I'm going to share with you today the progress that we have made. The Assessment and Qualifications Group met last week and we considered and there was a broad welcome for proposals which will essentially, over a two-year period, remove uh, the unit assessments from national fives and from um, higher qualifications. And they will be replaced by a combination of an enhanced final uh, examination and by course assignment work that is undertaken during the year. So there will be, by those actions, a very significant reduction in the workload of teachers in the secondary sector, a direct response to the need to create space for teachers to be able to teach and to enhance the learning experience of young people within Scotland. Now that is me taking the action across three different areas, curriculum guidance, the local authority assessment burden, and the workload that is required in the assessment and examination system to meet the needs of reducing workload in Scottish education. For what purpose? For the purpose of liberating teachers to teach and to close the attainment gap in Scottish education. So those are the actions that I can take and I'll continue to pressurise to reduce teacher workload. But I have also got to say to the teaching profession in Scotland, I can do these things with organisations, with the SQA, with Education Scotland, with individual local authorities, but I cannot stand in your classrooms and take away unnecessary bureaucracy that, heaven forfend, teachers themselves may have generated of their own volition. Heaven forfend. Nor can I stand in the offices of head teachers and say to head teachers, why are you requiring that administrative burden from your teachers? But what I can say to you today is that you must feel empowered by the message that you're getting from the Education Secretary today, from the guidance, from the changes in the SQA assessment uh, 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 processes, and from the demands to reduce local authority bureaucracy, that teachers themselves must take the steps to reduce that burden um, and to ensure that every moment that is available, that can be available, to concentrate on the learning experience of young people in Scotland is maximised so that we can get the full fruits and the benefit of all of that activity. So those are the
the measures that I've been able to take in four short months, four short months as Education Secretary to get us into a position where the issues of teacher workload are being addressed and will be reduced to ensure that teachers are liberated to teach, to give the educational contribution that our young people require and have the need to benefit from. Now that of course is one part of the agenda, the purpose, to come back to my ceramic pile, the purpose of delivering excellence and equity in Scottish education. But the rest of the agenda is about how we truly deliver excellence and equity in every single part of our country. And that's where the National Improvement Framework, they focus on ensuring that we have a clear idea through standardised assessment and forming teachers' uh, judgments about the performance of pupils, about how we can take the necessary steps to improve and to, uh, to performance and to identify where performance needs to be strengthened. It comes from putting in £750 million of resources into the attainment challenge, as the government has promised to do, to make sure that we put the resources in place in the education system to improve the performance of young people. That we give the signals, as we've given in the curriculum guidance, that within the, the broad general education, ensuring that we have strong foundations in literacy, numeracy and health and well-being are understood and taken forward to deliver that improvement in performance for young people. And that we take the necessary steps to ensure that wherever we are, in, wherever education is taking place in Scotland, we are focusing directly on the measures and the steps to improve the performance of young people in Scotland. Because when I trace it all back to the policy framework that I started with, when we are in business to get it right for every child, we have to make sure that we have the necessary focus and the impetus to achieve all of that for every single young person who is part of the education system in Scotland and to help us to support and to enable every young person to fulfil their potential. And as part of that whole exercise of strengthening Scottish education, of focusing on the, the measures that will improve performance, one of the other things I want to do, and I set this out last week, is have a debate about how we can best govern Scottish education to make sure that the decisions that matter to the educational development of young people are taken where I think they can best be taken and that's as close to those young people in the schools as, of Scotland as we possibly can be. So in the consultation that I, I launched last week on governance, I pose one fundamental question. The most precious bit of our education system, the most precious and valuable element is the interaction between a teacher and a pupil. That is how education is conveyed. That is how it is shared with a young person. And the questions we've got to answer as a system are how do we enhance that? What do we do to add value to that teaching experience? And the governance arrangements of Scottish education must support that. Because it strikes me that Scottish education and that interaction between pupil and teacher will be strengthened if more control is vested in schools able to take decisions about what young people need in a quick, pragmatic way to add value to that educational experience for young people. So I encourage you, all of you, right across the country, to take part in this conversation about how we should structure Scottish education to ensure that that precious relationship, the most valuable relationship we have of teachers conveying educational value to young people um, is enhanced in the most effective way we possibly can do. And that's the question that lies at the heart of the governance review of Scottish education. So in bringing my remarks to a close, let me say a couple of final things. The first is that I'm looking forward to our, our, our question and answer session and we've got plenty of time to address issues that colleagues here in the room and around the, ex the SECC and out in the field have got to, to raise with me. Um, I've undertaken a number of such discussions face-to-face uh, -face and also digitally across the country. Um, I undertook a Glow Meet last week, which had participation from around 50 centres in the country, including colleagues in the Shetland Isles, who were able to input into that conversation, despite being far away from where I was in Parliament in Edinburgh. I want to be available for this conversation about how I can listen to you about how we strengthen Scottish education. 
because I hope you accept that in the course of the last few months, I have listened very carefully to the issues and the concerns about workload within Scottish education, and I have taken decisive action in a short space of time to address that. And I will continue to do that. Because all of that is crucial to liberate the teaching profession to teach. And if we liberate the teaching profession to teach, then we will have the best chance we have ever had to close the attainment gap in Scottish education. I went through the Scottish education system. I was very fortunate to go to a fantastic school, Forrester High School in Edinburgh. And from there, I, got, I, I, I was educated at the University of Edinburgh. I had a fantastic experience of Scottish education. And I want to make sure that into whichever primary school or early learning centre in this country that a young person goes, they can be assured that they have the opportunity to achieve excellence and equity as a consequence of their involvement in Scottish education. We've got a really exciting opportunity. The government's highest priority is the closure of the attainment gap in Scottish education. The highest political priority of the government is to deliver that educational transformation and I've been appointed by the First Minister as her deputy to lead that process. But I cannot do it on my own. I need to do it in consort with every single one of our teachers around the country, with our professional associations, with our professional organisations, with government agencies, with our, whole, with our local authority partners right across the board, focused with purpose on closing the attainment gap in Scottish education. We have an exciting opportunity to interrupt a cycle which has bedeviled Scotland for most of my adult life that not everybody is able to fulfill their potential. And we have to make sure that we empower and support every single individual in our education system to fulfill their potential. If we do that, we will have lived out the values that sit on the mace of the parliament in, in Edinburgh. We will have lived out the values that are right at the heart of curriculum for excellence. Values of wisdom, compassion, justice, and integrity. We will have brought those to life and we will have delivered a transformative effect on the young people of Scotland. I encourage you to come with me on what is going to be an exciting journey to make Scottish education world class. Thank you very much. Winnie, thank you very much for a, a very informative keynote address and um, dealing with many areas, many topical areas. So I'm sure we will have um, some questions for the Deputy First Minister. As he said, he's uh, allocated some time for a, a Q&A. And I'd encourage all those in rooms elsewhere to make use of the Education Scotland staff, write down a question, and it will be whisked to me on the stage here in the Lomond Auditorium. But I'm going to start off with any questions from our, uh, our delegates within the auditorium. We have uh, two mics that uh, we can get to you. If you raise your hand, and I'll ask for your name and your organization. So we have a question in the front here. And there's also one right at the very back. I think we'll take two at a time, Mr. Swinney. Does that sound good? Okay, so we'll, if we'll, where are our mics? Okay, if we can have one either side. Right, are we going for the person? Right, you've got one there. Okay, we'll take that question first then. And then there's another one at the back. Okay. Sheila Waddo, I'm a teacher, chartered teacher with Glasgow City Council. Um, you're spending £88 million to maintain teacher numbers and teacher induction places. Yet yesterday in the Herald, we read in Andy Denham's column that 130 teachers have not been able to get places to do their probationary year. What action are you taking to address that, particularly in view of the fact that at least seven local authorities Places like Aberdeen's come to mind have serious teacher shortages. Okay, so a question there about um, probationary teachers, and there's one at the front as well. Hello, my name's Mark Nallon. I'm not a teacher, I'm a parent. Uh, and I was just interested to hear you say you can't be in every classroom and you can't be in every office or every head teacher's office. So my question is, how are you, how are you going to ensure full transparency 
so parents don't want uh, that don't want to necessarily go to a once a month meeting can get full information about all aspects about how the school's doing how it's performing in relation to other areas and just general you know as a as a, a stakeholder or as a shareholder within any company the information so that you know how it's operating and what the challenges and, and problems with it are um, first of all on, on sheila's question it's a very important question um, there are 120, or as of yesterday, there was 128 uh, uh, teachers look, uh, students looking for student placements. Uh, the total cohort is 6,500, so the overwhelming majority of placements have been arranged. But um, I express my, um, my, my frustration yesterday in Parliament about the fact that, given exactly the point you make, Sheila, that there are areas of the country where we're short of teachers, why we're not finding enough placements and we need the placements to be offered by individual schools and by local authorities and we need those to be matched with individual students so what um, we've been i've been talking about this to the general teaching council pressing them to make sure all those connections are made because there's no shortcut to this we quite simply need to have more places in schools to allow the students to go to them so there's no there's no sophisticated solution we just need more of those places um, the directors of education have been contacted to maximise the pressure on them to offer more places. Um, the university are talking directly to individual local authorities to try to place individuals. Um, and we, School Leaders Scotland, have been activated to liaise with head teachers to encourage head teachers to offer more places. Uh, because it's essential we get that link up made so that we can allow young people to go through their. Um, their teacher training uh, properly and effectively and they can then get into the classrooms and begin to fill some of those teacher vacancies so it is a it's a small number within the overall cohort that have needed placements but it's one too many Sheila and uh, the, the the issues have been taken forward I'll get a report later on today as to how much progress has been made today but those placements have got to be fulfilled and they've got to be fulfilled uh, timorously and um, on Mark's point over here, um, the, I think the, uh, there's a, a, sort of a careful judgment to be applied about um, how much information is um, conveyed to, um, to parents and how much we should just encourage greater parental involvement in the life and the circumstances of schools. You know, as a parent of a five-year-old child who's at primary school in Scotland, I can see the school going to significant lengths to involve parents in all aspects of the educational journey, whether that's about um, coming into school to read with my son while he's at school or whether it's about taking part in um, other curriculum-based activities within the school. There's a lot of effort put in to try to involve parents in that process. And out of the school governance review, I want to open up the discussion about how do we better and best inf involve parents as an asset in strengthening the school community within Scotland. And I discussed many of these issues with the National Parent Forum on Saturday when I was um, meeting with them to consider how we can support and strengthen parental involvement in education. So there's a, a huge um, opportunity here to activate that resource. I think. In terms of my teacher workload issue, I think there's a lot of burden on teachers reporting to parents to kind of, I don't know, fulfill a lot of detail that actually puts a burden on teachers and doesn't actually inform parents that terribly much. So there, there has to be a, a kind of careful balance struck so that parents are well informed about how their young people are performing, how the school is performing, but without that becoming um, information overload and being a burden on teachers who could be spending that time teaching and educating young people in Scotland. Okay, I think we'll take another couple of questions. There's one right at the very back there. In fact, there's two at the back. Why don't we uh, take a couple of questions from the back? And I think there's more questions coming. Uh, Simon Bradbury, a guidance teacher from Clackmallinshire. Uh, when we talk about uh, closing the gap and equity, I think you agree one of the key issues at the minute is the mental health of our young people. Uh, this is challenging enough in of itself, but it's even more challenging when health services are pulling back supports available in schools, CAMs are failing to meet targets and downgrade priority referrals made by GPs. 
local GPs who come across mental health issues uh, refer parents to schools because the schools will deal with it. Uh, the psychological services, educational psychologists, they're changing their model, so there's less one-to-one -one work with young people. And social work CP thresholds are very, diff very different from what ours would be. Um, this might just be my local authority, but I have my doubts. Obviously, the third sector can help. Bernardo's, Women's Aid, all do excellent work for our young people. But okay, my question is, where is the specific mental health support for our young people going to come from? Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that question. And I think there's another question at the back, which we'll, we'll take at the same time. My name is Patrick McGrory. I am a faculty head of technologies at Shawlands Academy. Secondary School in Glasgow, and yes, John, I met you on that yep. day as well. Mm -hmm. It's a great day. My question is about the national assessments. The, the unit's been removed, which I welcome. And, but you talked about an enhanced assessment or an enhanced exam. Could you tell us more about that? And what, when will teacher, teachers be informed more about that? Okay, on Simon's point, and uh, I think the reaction of the audience says it all about the significance of this point, and what we saw in the most recent data is that the, there's been a 30% increase in the referrals for mental health support within Scotland. Um, and clearly that's a significant, a, a, a rise of that magnitude is a significant challenge for our services to, to, to address. Uh, the best way to handle this is to think of this through the thinking of getting it right for every child. Because what that requires us to do is not in a compartmentalised way for... The way you outlined your, your, your question, and I, I don't say this to be in any way critical, in a sense it illustrates what the challenge we've got to overcome. But I mean, you know, the, 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 the problem or the issue may be passed from one compartmentalised public service to another. Give it to the school, they'll sort it out. We have to look at this as a public sector about how do we get it right for every child. Because the intervention for every child may involve some degree of third sector involvement and partnership. It may involve some schoolwork. It might involve some health service involvement into the bargain. There are a whole host of different ways in which all of that has to be woven together to meet the needs of that individual child. So it will not be... Um, it's a part of my whole approach to public service activity, and this is where I work very closely with my other colleagues, is that if we focus on the getting it right for every child approach, we will draw in different services to look at the needs of that young pe person, ideally intervene as early as possible, and if we intervene as early as possible, we will minimise the risk of the escalation and the growing significance of that problem. Um, but that requires a really joined up approach to public services. And in, you know, that, that is what the integrated joint boards at local level are designed to do, to try to provide that community focus between local authorities and the health service and to break down what is frankly a false barrier between health service and local government services because generally individuals will need and require um, all of that uh, intervention and support. So um, the, the importance of um, ensuring that the needs of young people are adequately and appropriately met in that fashion is the most effective way to deal with that and to ensure we have that range of services in place. Um, now, Patrick's point about um, uh, the changes to the, um, the SQA qualification arrangements, um, they will be introduced over a, a, a two-year period. So for NAT4, they will be introduced in 17-18, and for, uh, for NAT5, sorry, in 17-18, and for hires in 18-19. So there'll be uh, advance warning as to the steps that have been taken and we're doing that in a way so that we can do this in an orderly and organised fashion uh, to meet um, the, the legitimate needs of the teaching profession as you said. The question of enhancing the, um, the, uh, the, the, the course um, assessment is about making sure that course coverage is being delivered by the course assessment. So it's essential if we're taking away the unit assessments we have to make sure that the skills that are being tested and assessed within the unit assessments can be adequately covered in the, uh, the course assessment. Um, so that's the development work that will, that will be undertaken uh, to ensure that we have that adequate course coverage as part of the process. 
Thank you very much for those questions. Some have managed to get through uh, the, the corridors to us here on the stage. And um, if I could just ask, uh, there's a couple come through on digital learning, actually. So if we could maybe take those together. And then there's one on the uh, attainment gap. But what part will digital learning play in closing the attainment gap? And given the importance of it to the future of Scotland and its citizens, what are your plans for ensuring digital learning and teaching is at the heart of Scottish education, so, so two really that are covering the same thing there. And, uh, and then someone pointing out that the attainment gap starts well before primary school. What plans do you have to improve quality and performance in early learning and childcare settings? Okay. The, um, on the digital question, uh, fundamentally, um, uh, uh, the digital activity is transforming the way all of us, all of us are living our lives. Um, so education will be no different. Um, the, the, key, the key starting point for this is that if we're going to have, which I think we should have, greater reliance on digital technology and greater use of it, um, bluntly, the wiring has got to work. And I suspect there'll be schools around the country that will sit looking at those little ticker times that go around, <laughs> waiting endlessly for something to happen, for something to come to life. And I don't mean that as a flippant point. If we're going to use digital technology, you have to be able to have a strength of connection that enables you to use it. It's nothing is more frustrating than sitting watching that wee ticker timer thing going around. So there's a link here with the, the government's wider program on connectivity to make sure that we've got the rollout of superfast broadband in a fashion that it can, and this isn't just a, a rural Scotland problem, you know, I represent rural Perthshire, but there'll be, where there's many challenges in getting digital connectivity, but there'll be parts of Perth city centre that I represent as well, that'll have just as many challenges getting that connectivity into the bargain. So the strength of connection is really important. Second thing is about our, um, uh, our, our outlook on digital learning, and I think there's a number of different ways. There will be individual learning devices, which will be of assistance in supporting the educational experience of young people. And I've seen a number of good examples about how that's been deployed within schools, which is actually helping young people because of the intuitive interaction with digital technology. It's helping them to overcome challenges that they had that were um, more difficult in traditional um, uh, educational uh, arrangements. But there will also be ways, innovative ways in which we can make sure that learning can be shared across a wider um, locality. A few weeks ago, I was up in the Western Isles and I was um, launching a very good initiative that the council has taken forward there of an e-school, which is essentially going to link up the, uh, a number of the schools within the Western Isles so that they can broaden the course offering to young people so that if in, in one school, that are unable to do, I don't know, let's, let's say Spanish, it can be provided through um, digital uh, technology and connection with um, other centres. And they're now also talking beyond the Western Isles with a range of other local authorities to share that, that platform. And that gives us more flexibility and more ability to meet the, the needs of young people as a consequence. So um, I think there's many, many attributes of digital learning that we should be utilising. Um, we are... Um, obviously, the investments were made by Education Scotland in GLOW is a significant resource in sharing that digital learning across the country, uh, but we have to make sure we make maximum value and utilisation out of that. Um, the, uh, on on the, the, the second point <coughs> about the attainment gap, I think we've, if you look at the report of um, the Commission on Widening Access into Higher Education, the, the, the report produced by Dame Ruth Silver, um, uh, some months ago. One of the points in that report, actually the first point in that report, is that the challenge of widening access to higher education requires what Dame Ruth describes as a whole system approach. So it's not just about getting our universities to change some of their admission practices, it is about having the whole system adapting to how we enable young people to access higher education by improving their attainment. So the questioner is absolutely right. It starts way back and we have to make sure that there is uh, strength and depth within our early years proposition that's available to, to, to young people. So the, 
The government has set out uh, our intention as we expand um, early learning um, to um, 1140 hours for three and four year olds and some two year olds that there will be a stronger educational component in that um, particularly for young people uh, coming from deprived backgrounds. So enhancing that educational um, provision is an important part of the rolling out and the expansion of that early years education. Thank you very much. And uh, any more questions from the auditorium? There's a few hands up. So if we can take another couple. There's one here and then there's some over the side. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bill O'Hara, Principal Educational Psychologist for Aberdeen City Council. I think there's a number of threads that have come out today about early intervention, early years, equity of access, raising, att raising attainment and mental health. And these are all areas by legislation that lie at the door of educational psychology. I had the opportunity three years ago of asking Mike Russell what was happening about training for educational psychologists. About eight years ago, the funding was removed. At that time, the two university courses in, in Scotland, Dundee and Strathclyde, attracted somewhere between 170 and 220 candidates. This last year, the most recent retreating programme received 30 applications. For the first time ever, they had to have a second recruitment phase. They attracted eventually 19 candidates for 24 places. In the last few weeks, two of those candidates dropped out because of lack of funding. We used to have a, a bursary system from government which covered the university fees and also gave a small living allowance. If people choose to do clinical psychology, they have a training salary funded between education, the NHS Education Scotland and the, the health boards of £25,500. They also have their university fees paid and expenses. So in terms of training a very specialised, highly effective profession, there's clearly a, an equity issue. Now, we heard from Mike Russell three years ago. Are you going to ask a question? Yes. Because I'm yes, trying absolutely. to get as many questions yes, in as possible. Yes, I just want possible. to give context so because he get said... get a question yes. for me, thanks. So, he said he were in the senior civil servants in discussion with the profession. I want to know what the outcomes are going to be and what the substantive progress has been in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think there's more questions over this side. Where are the people with the microphones? Can't see you. Hello, my okay. name is Jane Arthur and I'm head teacher at Piddy Park Primary School in Govan in Glasgow. And I just wanted to say that for the first time in many years, we are welcoming the extra investment in order to close the attainment gap. But as I spend an inordinate amount of time working with the most vulnerable families and multi-agency working and the bureaucracy that meeting learners needs and the needs of our most vulnerable families and their children, there is not much time left for senior managers in school to actually focus on the core business, which is learning. And that's a concern for me, and I think it's got a huge amount of um, relevance when we're struggling to get people to apply for senior leader posts in schools as deputies and heads. But I have a real concern about being completely and utterly focused on closing the attainment gap. But we can't do that until we look more closely at closing the poverty gap. In 2016, we should not have children that don't have appropriate clothing for school. The poverty in some of our families has got to be addressed before they even reach pre-5 or early years or primary school. There is such a huge gap and it's so heartbreaking to see the dire poverty in some of our communities and some of the challenges that our children and their families face. And there are many, many reasons for them facing this. But until we can do something to address that, these children are, are starting off at zero at a huge disadvantage to all other children. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. um, on the, the first of those points, Bill, I'll, I'll go and look at the situation with education psychologists, and I'm very happy to have a discussion with the profession and um, with my officials about um, where... Um, issues have reached uh, because to link it back to uh, Simon's question at the very back um, there is obviously a clear relationship between your point and the point that Simon made about the availability of personnel so I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at that and um, uh, and take forward further discussions to address the points that you've raised I don't have a, 
a specific answer for you today, um, but I'll look at that very carefully. On Jane's point, um, I suppose this well, bluntly gets to the nub of it, Jane, uh, and it's um, what I've essentially tried to say to you today is that we have got, uh, I think, a really exciting opportunity to use education as effectively as we can to try to interrupt the poverty that young people are experiencing in our country. Now, I, I don't dispute a word of what you said about the challenges that families face. And part of what, you know, without, you know, without me going down a kind of, um, a particularly party political route, you'll not be surprised to hear I'm not a fan of the austerity environment in which we're living, which I think is unjustified and unnecessary. And it's putting more pressure on vulnerable families in that respect, and it's putting pressure on public expenditure in general. So I've argued long and hard for us to take a different course on that strategic question. But what we have to try to do is to make sure that we use <coughs> the resources available to us and the opportunity to link up and to coordinate public services to make a profound impact on those young people. Now, your point about the exhausting nature of servicing multi-agency bureaucracy is a point that I'll, uh, I'll take away with me today because if I'm reducing the workload on the teaching profession in the straightforward education service, there's no point in having that added to by wider multi-agency working. So I'll take that point away and put as much oomph into addressing that as I put into addressing teachers' workload. Because fundamentally, I need a teaching profession that is constantly professionally, professionally developing because only through con constant professional development will we strengthen the uh, ability to, uh, to deliver for Scottish pupils. And a part of that is a effective professional leadership within the education system that can deliver that enhanced education to young people into the bargain. So I need you to be out there enhancing and strengthening the education proposition of your teaching staff um, uh, as part of your leadership of, of the school. So there's, an, uh, so there's a necessity for us to use all of the devices and interventions that we have available to us. As a government, we are trying to take a number of steps in the new powers that we're, that we're taking on in relation to welfare to try to interrupt some of that um, a, the experience of, of poverty that young people are facing. But fundamentally, we have to make sure that we strengthen um, economic opportunity in Scotland, and to strengthen economic opportunity, we have to strengthen educational opportunity, and the two go hand in hand. But I don't dispute the, 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 the conditions and the circumstances in which you're operating, and I also have seen countless occasions the intervention that the teaching profession makes to improve the circumstances of young people coming into school either not well fed or not well clothed or appropriately clothed for school. And I appreciate the fact that that's teachers going the extra mile, but it's an important contribution that's made nonetheless. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to just take another two. I know we've got a question here and I've got one from, um, from the rooms. We're going to run over ever so slightly, but Mr. Swinney said that was okay if there were lots of questions and there, there have been lots of questions. So if you'd like to ask your question, then I'll, I'll read this one. Hello, um, my name's Angelina Lombardo. I'm the head teacher of a special school in Edinburgh. Like many of my colleagues, I often feel that special schools are left out of national discussions and debates and we're almost forgotten about. And I wondered if you had any specific plans to focus on special schools, the special sector, and if so, what th those plans are. Thanks for that question. And also just picking up on the developing the young workforce that was mentioned during your keynote, um, how long do you envisage it being before a positive impact is seen on employment and young people? So what sort of timescales are, are you working towards? Well, we, on, on that point, we actually um, are seeing a constant improvement in positive outcomes for young people, uh, in, uh, of young people re reaching positive destinations as a consequence of their um, educational journey. And 
there's also, I thought, one of the, great, one of the points that I latched on to and concentrated on in my media work around exams day was the 23% increase in vocational qualifications that were achieved within the school system within Scotland, which I thought was a significant indication that the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce Agenda is beginning to have an effect um, fully and effectively within Scottish education. It'll take some time for it to have uh, maximum effect, but it's about making sure that we, um, uh, we encourage and motivate as much um, participation within uh, vocational activities as we possibly can do. Because going back to my kind of three policy arrangement, we'll get it right for every child uh, by ensuring that there's a strong linkage to the developing Scotland's Young Workforce Agenda. And if as a country we are prepared to celebrate as much uh, the achievement of a modern apprenticeship as we're prepared to celebrate the achievement of a university degree, then I think we'll be a lot stronger as a country as a consequence. And I hope that, I hope the, the concentration on expanding the relationship between schools and um, the college sector in enhancing learning and in bringing those sectors much closer together, it gives much better opportunities for young people uh, to fulfil their potential. Now, Angelina, your point about special schools, um, I actually visited a special school just, um, I think it was just last week. The weeks are all merging into one. Uh, it must have been just last week, uh, East Park School out on Maryhill Road in, in Glasgow. And it was a marvellous example of how we get it right for every child. And those were young, young people with very profound uh, needs and challenges. And that school was working intensively to transform outcomes. And I saw a young man on that occasion, a young lad called Liam. And um, the, the, the school shared with me um, the challenges that Liam had faced over, I think Liam had been at the school for about eight years. And Liam was a fabulous young man, 17, fabulous young man. But that school had helped him to achieve that and to be that. And it was a joy, a joy to see it. So there are, in a sense, my answer to you is that, yes, I appreciate the role of special schools. Um, I see them as integral to the agenda of getting it right for every child because there will be additional intervention um, that is required to try to ensure that uh, the needs of young people are met most effectively. Um, and I'm obviously very happy to engage directly with the sector to make sure that I understand the challenges you face and the role that you can perform in helping us to meet the needs of every child in Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the delegates who um, have asked questions. But there